This podcast channel is about you, successful international entrepreneurs, successful expats, successful investors, sponsored by HCJ Contacts. Okay, good morning, good day, good afternoon, depending on what part of the world you are. I'm just going to turn off. All right. Restart, restart. <clears throat> okay. Thank you for joining us, uh, HEJ.tax. Thank you for Christine and the management team at the AARO for making this happen. We really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to you guys. So without further ado, we're going to jump in. Now, this is being recorded. So if you do not want your image to be uh, captured in the recording and you're on Zoom, all you need to do is keep your camera switched off. So just, just a, a heads up with that. Okay. So I will now share my screen. And for those that could not join or those that may join later or whatever, if you have colleagues or friends that were asking and couldn't make it because it's too early, too late to whatever, uh, please let them know that Kathleen will be posting uh, a copy of this video, this, this recording on the AARO website. So please contact her directly uh, if you want to get access to that. So, okay, just going to pull this down and I'm going to share. Oops. Okay, thank you for joining us, HGL.tax. We do these every week, actually. So uh, if you have a look at our website, HGL.tax, uh, we do live streams every week. We enjoy the Q&As, we enjoy the interaction and hearing firsthand uh, the, the challenges and, you know, the, the key questions and concerns that people have, regardless of where in the world you may be. So our website is hda.tax. We also use a brand name, Advanced American Tax, because that works well with Google search. Uh, in Asia, we're part of Moore's Roland. So we're under Moore's Roland Tax Consultants in Asia. That's, we have about... 30 offices in 12, and 13, 12 or 13 countries so as far north as Tokyo and Beijing all the way down to uh, Sydney and Melbourne. And we, through our affiliate network, we also cover uh, most of Europe as well as parts of Latin America and South Africa as well. So that's a little bit about us. I'm actually based in Singapore. I've been based in Singapore since 2013. Uh, so that that's that's where I am. But I mean, pre-COVID, I, I would travel a lot, but not as much since you know the the whole health crisis that's facing us. <clears throat> this is me. So I'm U.S. qualified. So I do have some authority to talk about what I do talk about. I also published three books, which are available on Amazon. But more importantly, and I just want to highlight this. It's a disclaimer, right? There's no way that anyone can give advice based on just a few minutes interaction on, on social media, right? So nothing here is, can, should be construed as advice. Nothing here should be construed as encouraging you to pay less in your fair share of taxes in any jurisdictions in which you're exposed. You can consider, you can consider this entertainment or education, uh, but this is not advice. What I'm hoping that you would walk away with this. So your takeaway are what are the key concepts and principles that you need to bear in mind as you engage with your preferred tax team? And yeah, so, the, so that's really the takeaway. I do, one shouldn't expect at the end of an hour to be able to comprehensively do one's own returns, right? So this is not an instructional video. So this is how I keep myself from being sued. Fantastic. So. So just five sections because I wanted to leave time at the end for Q&A. Some, some of you did submit questions in advance. Thank you for that. For those that have not, if you're on Zoom, just look at the chat box below and you can type your questions and then at the end, I'll get into that. If you're on Facebook or one of the other platforms that this is being live streamed on, you can type into the box below and I'll have a look once we finish the, uh, the, the, the bit of a slideshow. All right. 
So without further ado, let's jump in. So the head of our US uh, tax team, the guy who's actually running the team that does the returns, this is Ronnie looking so chilled and relaxed. He's ex JP Morgan, which is a relatively well-known US bank. These are the basics. So this, I wanna start with basics, right? These are your basic responsibilities as a US person residing outside of the US or with some sort of foreign exposure. The first thing is remember your bank accounts, right? So there's something called uh, FBARS, your foreign bank account report of or otherwise known as FinCEN 114. It's not new. I think it came from 1970, 71, the Bank Secrecy Act. So it's been around for a long time. What has happened is because of the Patriot Act, there's a lot more teeth in it, in the legislation. So if it is that you do not comply, the, the penalties can be not just civil, but criminal as well. So you can be charged up to 50% of the unreported balance. So an example I like to give is in Florida. So we have an office in Florida. So I talk about Florida. There was a dentist who happened to have just about a million dollars in a trust in Switzerland. And for whatever reason, he forgot that he had this money in this account. He didn't report it to, to the IRS. So the IRS held that he did not report it for three years and they went to the maximum, which is 50% of the unreported balance. So his penalty was $1.5 million in an account with $1 million in it. So it was settled out of court. I don't know how much he eventually paid, but that was what was thrown at him. What you realize when it comes to international tax, and I'm, I'm always... Uh, you know, I always make a big deal about communicating this. International tax for the Internal Revenue Service is not necessarily about revenue collection. It's about data, big data. Data is gold. Data is the most precious commodity right now. So for forms like this, and we know that this is their priority. Why? Because look at the penalties. The penalties that they would throw at you for not paying your taxes are relatively small compared to the penalties that they would throw at you for not declaring foreign investments, including foreign accounts, foreign pension funds, foreign uh, insurance policies that may be, uh, whether, you know, they may be wrapped up as a pension or insurance, but they're viewed as being an investment account. So that, those disclosures, that's what they wanna know. They wanna know what it is you're doing outside. Okay. So please pay attention declare your bank accounts, depending on how much your maximum aggregate balance would be. And that's another misconception that it's not just the balance in one account, but your maximum aggregate balance across all your financial accounts, all, all your bank accounts. Uh, it needs to be declared not just on the FBARs, but potentially on a, a new, relatively new form called an 8938 or FATCA form, which kind of mirrors what's on the FBARs. But it goes, so FinCEN 114, it's collected by the IRS, but it doesn't actually go to the IRS. It goes to another team in Treasury called the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. So the 8938, which to some extent mirrors what's on the FBOS, that goes to the IRS. So, you know, you need to be speaking to your tax team about that. Next, E, estimated taxes, because you want to do your best. E, estimated taxes. When you back in the US, maybe you got paid on a W-2, so when you got your wages, like every two weeks or every month, they, it was subject to withholding. So the IRS would get their money as you earned it, right? But you're outside of the US. So depending on your situation, you may wanna pay attention and speak to your tax team about estimated tax responsibilities because if taxes are due, the IRS doesn't wanna wait until April 15, 2022 to get paid what they were owed on uh, 2021 income, right? They want to get it along the way. They don't want to wait. So you, the very least you should be looking at are uh, four quarterly payments due in April, June, September, and January. So failure to do that it triggers a form 2210. So there's an, there's an underpayment penalty, which depending on the quantum can be, can leave you, you know, it's a bit of a stink. So if you don't want to pay that penalty, speak to your tax team, estimate the taxes. You want to do your best. S stands for state. So 
of course you have, I mean, most people focus on federal, but depending on what state you uh, deem to be domiciled in, state can be a big issue as well. Because depending on your state, most states, uh, uh, domiciled states to the extent that even though you may have left the state physically, so you physically reside outside of, of the state and you outside of the US, you may actually, under some circumstances, have state tax responsibilities. So what we, especially if you come from, I mean, really sticky state would be like Virginia, also California. So what we coach our clients on would be, hey, pay attention to states where you, you know, which state were you last residing in, where you deemed to be domiciled in the U.S., which state, right? And perhaps you want to think about switching domicile to one of those eight states that do not have an income tax, you know, most popularly Florida, Texas, Nevada, you know. Switch to one of those states, you know, you're looking at changing your driver's license, your voter registration. So the point is that we've seen so many clients who at some point in time return to live in the U.S. And as part of their welcome back package, they get a huge bill from the state that they thought that they had no connection to. And it is, yeah, it is not just an inconvenience. It can be really scary. So be proactive, speak to your tax team, get your state taxes right. Transfer taxes, again, something that many forget about that you know gift and estate taxes right now you know people we're quite conscious of estate planning and um, own mortality and stuff like that so estate planning is important but gift taxes gift taxes so if it is that you you're living outside of the u.s you get into business or personal relationships with people who may not be uh u.s tax residents americans so if it is you have a non-american boyfriend girlfriend uh partner husband, wife, whatever the case may be, bear in mind that the transfer of assets back and forth may trigger some sort of disclosure, at least disclosure to the IRS. And depending on the amount, it may even trigger a tax, depending, right? So the failure for not reporting a gift could be up to, you know, 30% of the value of the gift. So it's, it, for most people, there is no tax liability, simply a reporting requirement. So there's no downside. Just, just speak to your tax team, make sure that they're aware that you have given or received gifts and have a conversation about whether any disclosure is required. I'll start with the UK as per the table of contents earlier shared. So in the UK, our key team members, and at least in the UK side will be Weldon, ex big four accountant and Mikael who is a barrister. So, you know, in the UK, it's not like the US where everyone is an attorney, right? In the UK uh, and other, other common law jurisdictions, they separate the uh, barrister from the solicitor. So he's a barrister, not just for the UK, but also in some of the offshore Caribbean jurisdictions, because for some of our clients, uh, some off sort of offshore structuring is something that can help optimize their tax position, right? So as I go into these jurisdictions, uh, you know, obviously not in detail, but just kind of give highlights. What I'm what I'm hoping to do is for the more, I mean, when you Google in two minutes, you'll find lots of people who can plug figures into return. So that that's easy, right? Take your numbers, plug them into return. So we're not form fillers. We are tax advisors. So we work with people who may be considered high net worth or at least people who have more sophisticated or more challenging tax situations. And we help them tax optimize and tax plan across the various jurisdictions in which they're exposed, right? So what I wanna do is throw some nuggets at you guys. So these are some really cool ways of tax planning and optimizing that you would wanna take up and you know have a conversation with your preferred tax team about. So, Let's start with the UK. Obviously in the Europe, we know in, in Europe in general, for those who are based in Europe, and I think most of you are, Europe is not synonymous with low taxes, right? In general, Europe is probably one of the higher tax jurisdictions in the entire world. Definitely uh, higher taxes in the US. So the highest tax rate in the UK would be 45% versus 37 as an individual in the US. But the point is that you're going to hit that 45% way faster 
in the UK than you would hit 37 in the US. So it's just the jump between uh, uh, the steps in the tax ladder, uh, quite aggressive in, in Europe. So, but you guys should know that if you're resident in Europe anyway. So <clears throat> bear in mind that the UK kind of created the concept of a trust. You know, uh, you know, the law goes back to the Crusades when, you know, people of means, so members of the aristocracy would, you know, become knights and head to de de defend Christendom. So obviously they left their, their wealth behind and they created the idea of trust. So I'm leaving my assets in your trust. So whoever the, the trusted individual or the trusted entity was while they go off and fight. And so that when they return, they won't be like Robin Hood, right? Who found that his situation was that he was swindled and he had nothing left. So, so the, the trust, the, the trust law in the UK, uh, England and Wales in particular, has a really long and rich heritage. There's, uh, there's not just a lot of uh, code or legislation around it, but there's a rich body of case law that is also reflected elsewhere in, in the English speaking world or in the co other common law jurisdictions in the world. And one of the cool things or one of the great things about being tax resident in the UK is that you do have the option of being taxed on the remittance basis. In other words, the income that you earn, not earn, but the income that is attributable to you, I wanna be careful of my words, the income that may be attributable to you can be excluded from UK taxes if you qualify and you elect to be taxed on the remittance basis. So, but if that income, so once it stays outside of the UK, whether it be in an offshore jurisdiction or back in the US, as long as it does not come into the UK, and again, the, lots of anti-avoidance rules have been uh, applied now. So it's not just about coming in because you can't take a loan against it or whatever, but once you don't enjoy any of the benefits of it, it won't be taxable. So, you know, it, that's a huge planning opportunity. And of course, IHT or inheritance tax planning, like in the US, you have estate uh, taxes that are levied on the estate of the person who passes. In the UK, there's inheritance tax as well that's levied on the estate of the, the person who's passed away. So there are great planning tools to mitigate that in the UK as there are in, in the US as well. So it, it revolves around the concept of domicile and it's different. So I know those who live in civil law jurisdictions, uh, France and elsewhere on the continent, domicile means something slightly different. Domicile, domicile tends to mean your place of habitual abode in the UK. And this is for, uh, I'm speaking specifically about England and Wales in particular. Uh, we, we'll get Q&A at the end. So please, yep questions at the end, right? So domicile is quite a sophisticated concept, but broadly it, it looks at your permanent home and to just to cut to the chase, if it is that you deem to be domicile outside of the UK, huge opportunity for tax optimization and tax savings. So talk to your, your preferred tax team about that. So you wanna think about trust and you wanna think about domicile planning. And this works well, particularly if you have not yet moved to the UK. So the, the more planning you can do in advance, not just the UK, but any jurisdiction, pre-immigration planning is super, super important. Don't wait until you're in neck deep to start thinking about planning. You're already there. You need to think about planning before you get there. So. Spain and Portugal. So we have Ricky in Barcelona and Augusto in Lisbon. So these are leads when it comes, when we talk about Spain and Portugal opportunities. It's amazing that uh, we get so many clients that come to us after having dealt with a, a tax team that just does the US only. When you're in a high tax jurisdiction, you have to, you have to optimize across borders. So both tax teams not just have, need to be able to speak to each other, but they need to work in tandem. They need to work in, you know, in lockstep with each other. Because what may be good for one jurisdiction may not be good for the other. So what may be wonderful from a US point of view is poison from a Spain and Portugal or European perspective and vice versa as well. So key tax planning opportunities in Spain and Portugal, just gonna run through this. NHR, non-habitual residence. So it's a variant 
of the Resnon Dom that we looked at in the UK, where to some extent, a lot of your income outside of, uh, in this case, Portugal, can be excluded from Portugal taxes for up to 10 years. It's a huge, huge win. But it's very, very nuanced. It's not as cut and dry as the UK and Ireland, where you know ev almost everything outside investment income wise, if it's earned within the jurisdiction, obviously it'd be taxable, but not all of your foreign income is excluded, right? Because pensions are taxed at 10%, securities income is taxed at 28%. <clears throat> so some planning is needed. So definitely, definitely, if you're there or if you're thinking of going there, whatever, you wanna, you, you'll be probably aware of it if you're there, but there are tools, there are planning tools that can reduce this. So NHR in combination with some cool from some intelligence structures can work in your favor. Of course, what happens after 10 years when the NHR is up? Well, that's 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 a, another conversation for another time. In Spain, you have the Beckham Law, which again works like the other two jurisdictions we've spoken about, Portugal and UK and Ireland, where you can exclude income that arises outside of Spain. It's much it's a, in a way, it's simpler than Portugal in that, you know, there are not that many carve outs, but to set it up requires more effort than it does in Portugal. So in Portugal, the NHR is just an election. In Spain, you need to set up a company. And it's so, but once you get over that hurdle, you're good to go. Spain and Spain is wonderful, but it only lasts for five years. And then after, then after that, you're under the full weight of the Spain uh, Spanish tax authorities, which are one of the more aggressive ones in Europe. And if you live in Spain, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Which return do you do first? Typically, with the way the tax treaties work in Spain and Portugal, you go, and you are that's where you reside, you're going to have to do Spain and Portugal taxes first. I meet so many people, you know, socially, people talk to me. And so which tax return do you do first? And, it's, and then they say, well, yeah, we always do a U.S. return first, and we just hand it to our, our Portugal uh, tax advisors or Spain, Spanish tax advisors, and then take it from there. And I don't say anything, but the bottom line is, hey, you are being double taxed. <clears throat> Simple as that. Because the way the double tax treaty works, uh, the U.S.-Spain double tax treaty and the U.S.-Portugal double tax treaty works, you need to do the local one first and recategorize the income. So you need to do some gymnastics on the form 1116 to get the credits on the US return. So again, <clears throat> just proves a point. You need to, whatever team you choose to work with, make sure that they're doing both because you need to keep both within sight uh, in your perspective to tax optimize across both jurisdictions. All right, so I will jump to the next one. So let's head to Asia, we'll come back to Europe, but let's head to Asia and talk about Asia for a while so Asia doesn't feel left out. So Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, many of our clients are. We have Bunyip in Singapore, we have Elaine in Hong Kong and Ravi in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. So again, the advantage of working with US tax teams with local knowledge because so many clients, or so many US, US, like they're based in the US tax teams, they don't understand like how the Central Providence Fund works in Singapore, the, the MPF in uh, Hong Kong, the EPF in Malaysia, and it just creates problems. Or if you're in Australia, the superannuation plan and stuff like that. So uh, the local pension and investment structures require special treatment and disclosure on your US tax forms. Just keep that in mind. <clears throat> CFC laws are uh, control foreign corp laws. So we have lots of clients that are investors, that are business owners, that are entrepreneurs. When you're in a lower tax jurisdiction, those CFC rules really do kick in. And the reason why is that in Europe, obviously being high tax, you're trying to solve for Europe to a large extent in your mind because that's the higher tax jurisdiction. So when you're doing your planning and stuff, it's all about Europe, Europe, Europe. When you're in Asia, it's it's kind of the opposite. It, they, these jurisdictions, at least, they're relatively low tax. So you kind of put in your, your brain power towards dealing with the, the U.S. And the U.S. has control foreign corp laws. Um, talking about subpart F, PFIC we'll discuss later, and guilty. 
And what that does, just to, um, you know, be very brief about it, because, you know, that's a whole topic and presentation and on, on their own. What those do, those are anti-deferral rules. So typically you'll be taxed. If you run a company, you'll be taxed on what comes out of the company to you in the US, right? So whether you get salary, like a bonus, consulting fees, or maybe dividends, after profit dividends, that's what you put in your, on your tax return and that's what the IRS would look at. When you're in a lower tax jurisdiction, particularly, uh, you need to be aware of the anti-deferral rules, which means that under certain circumstances, even though you don't take any money out of that company, it will be taxable to you. Weird, right? Because normally you'd expect, well, hold on, there's a veil of incorporation. That company is a separate legal entity from me. Why am I being taxed on that? It's because of those anti-deferral rules. For, uh, the most recent of which came in in 2017 under President Trump's Tax Cut and Jobs Act, which is the guilty, the global intangible low tax income tax. So for those of you who have structures in low tax jurisdictions, uh, like the ones that I mentioned, or even some other uh, popular so-called tax havens, uh, like the, the Middle East, United Arab Emirates, or certain Caribbean islands, or certain structures like in Panama, depending on what you're doing, you may have faced this or you probably will face it. So it's it's something, it's it's tough, but there, there are planning opportunities within it. So because what you, it creates a horrible uh, cash flow issue because you require to pay taxes on income that you can, actually you don't have. You, you did not receive the income, but you're going to be taxed on it because a company that, is US controlled has made a profit and that profit is attributable to you. <clears throat> there are great planning opportunities as well in trust structures because these are common law jurisdictions, Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, so ex British colonies. So a lot of the, the opportunities in terms of trusts, whether they're foreign non-grantor trusts or foreign grantor trusts, that they will be applicable and available to you if you're in those jurisdictions. So have that conversation with your, with your preferred tax team on those. Now we come to France, but I was told that like 90, 99% of you guys are in France. So Hervé in Paris. Uh, so Assurance V. So that is one of uh, the biggest challenges that we deal with when we have uh, clients that are both French and US exposed, because obviously France, you know, we spoke about Spain and Portugal, we spoke about the UK and to, you know, uh, Ireland is similar as well. You know, Italy, Belgium, uh, Switzerland, they all have carve outs where you can reside in Italy or Switzerland, or whatever, and you can exclude, there's an option to exclude certain classes of income that arise outside of those jurisdictions, right? There's an option. The one exception <laughs> is France, but then, hey, nobody moves to France because of taxes. They move despite the taxes, right? They love the country, they love whatever they love, and you end up in France. And then, surprise, surprise, you get kicked in the teeth with French taxes. Assurance Vs are a popular tax planning tool, as you are well aware, in terms of deferring or optimizing your French tax positions. So that's something like many people have. But one must be careful because from a U.S. perspective, it opens a whole can of worms. It, under some circumstances, not just Assurance Vs, but other uh, investment structures, in, in France and elsewhere as well. I mean, I'm not picking on France. Once you have some sort of the equivalent of a foreign mutual fund or some sort of self-directed investment structure, it may be what is called a PFIC, which you, know, you may have heard of, a passive foreign investment company. So this is basically uh, like a holding structure where most of the income is passive in nature. It's mostly investment income and they're mostly investment assets within the structure. So just kind of keeping it simple that way. It is super, super, super popular when you live in Europe. 
it's hard to avoid. You have to deliberately set about to avoid it. And sometimes uh, the person that is selling you it, whether it's the insurance person or the person in your bank, they may they may not understand U.S. tax rules. And, you know, I've heard it so many times. They, they would say, well, no, this is U.S. compliant. It is FATCA compliant. That is such a misnomer. FATCA is not a tax. Uh, I'll just take a, a little bit of a segue. FATCA is a framework for information exchange, the Financial Account Tax Compliant Act. So it is a framework for information exchange. It is not a tax. So when that advisor, that well-meaning advisor that's trying to sell you that product, tells you that something is FATCA compliant, what they mean is that there's information sharing. So that financial institution would share the information of US exposed account holders or US exposed investors with the US government. That's all that means, but it still may be a PFIC. So PFIC is a class of, or category that really arose in the 1980s under President Reagan because U.S. domestic financial institutions were complaining. They were like, hey, we have U.S. clients who are not investing with us in the U.S. They're investing overseas because they get to defer taxes in, in a way that they can't ordinarily do in, in the U.S. They're getting lots of tax breaks. So can you help us out with that? So then the PFIC rules were enacted. So bottom line is that it creates... Uh, pretty aggressive tax treatment. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good way of putting it. Pretty aggressive tax treatment of overseas mutual funds or mutual or investment structures. So again, there's a whole idea of phantom income. So once there's growth in the fund, even though you didn't get a distribution, but the value of the assets that you've invested in that fund has increased, you may have to pay US taxes on that growth. Yeah. So, so while a lot of these structures are tax efficient from a European or from a French perspective, they certainly are not. They're poison. They're poison pills in the U.S. side. So have that conversation with your tax team. If it is, and this happens a lot, we had people that thought, you know, hey, I'm living in Europe. I'm living in France, and I've made certain investments. And I thought, hey, all I needed to do was file uh, French tax returns. After all, you know, I live in. Paris. I don't live in New York anymore. I don't need to think about like U.S. taxes. Unfortunately, they figure out, hey, you know, even though you live outside of the U.S., it doesn't matter. You need to, you need to file and pay taxes. And then a, another misunderstanding is, well, there's something called the foreign earned income ex, uh, exclusion. So once I earn less than 100k U.S., I don't need to file any U.S. taxes. Mm, wrong. If you file, you know. The, the threshold for filing has nothing to do with foreign earned income exclusion. Foreign earned income exclusion is just as the name implies, you know, section 911 of the U.S. tax code gives the biggest and the best benefit to Americans working abroad, which is that you can exclude, it moves up with inflation. So uh, for last year, it's like 112K. So the first 112K of your income is excluded from U.S. taxes. That's great, right? But that doesn't mean you, you don't need to file. It's it, You file and it will be not taxable. So it's kind of like just a report, but you still need to file. So actually, if you, if you file, for example, married filing separately, the threshold for filing is $5. So if you made more than $5, you need to file a return. So speak to your preferred tax team about... If it is that you haven't filed because you didn't know you needed to file, you misinterpreted or you misunderstood the foreign and income exclusion, or maybe you've made investments in products like the Assurance V and you didn't declare it properly, you didn't do the, the Form 8621, it's not in your 8938, it's not in your FBAR. If it is that you've excluded any of your of foreign investments, you may have to back file to declare it. And there's a wonderful opportunity in terms of disclosure it's kind of like an amnesty in all but name once your non-compliance was non-willful so you did not willfully seek to evade taxes or deceive the internal revenue service right uh unfortunately the whole idea of willfulness is not discussed in the tax code so we look at case law so it's you know you intentionally sought to evade a known legal duty 
that's that's about willfulness. So I'm talking to people who are non willful. If it is that you have been willful, uh, again, reach out to us and we'll put you in touch with tax attorneys that specialize in situations like yours. But I'm talking about people who are non willful. If you're non willful, you may want to consider with your preferred tax team the streamlined compliance procedures. So they driven kind of like by the statute of limitations. So the statute of limitations is three years for return and six years for your FBARs, right? So if it is that you have not been properly disclosing what you need to disclose in your return, then you don't need to go all the way back. You can just do the last three years for which due date has already passed and the last six years for which due date has passed in your FBARs. And that's a huge deal. In addition to which you get to avoid legally the the penalties which i mentioned before is like up to 50 percent of the unreported balance for the f bars it could be ten thousand dollars per form per year for uh foreign companies or foreign partnerships and stuff like that so that's a huge win to avoid those really really aggressive penalties so you please talk to you prefer a tax team about streamlining right so that's a great way of coming to terms. If it is, hey, you did not know that your French uh, insurance or pension products or investment products were reportable in special ways on US returns, this, this is a, a great way to make it right, okay? Another thing to consider, uh, uh, another nugget to kind of discuss with your preferred tax team is the idea of the foreign earned income exclusion in principle. You know, I mentioned before, you know, Form 2555, you get to exclude up to the first 112K of your income from US taxes under one of two ways you can qualify under the physical presence test or the bona fide residence test, which we can get into if you, if you would like later on. Uh, you can just let me know in the Q&A and we can discuss it in more detail. But hey, you get to exclude this. This is a huge win. Let's all go and make sure that we claim that foreign earned income exclusion and that Form 2555. If you're in France, not necessarily. You know, what you can perhaps have a conversation with your tax team, because under many circumstances, it makes more sense to to waive or to not apply that foreign earned income exclusion and just go with your foreign tax credit. Why? Because the foreign, the French taxes are so much higher than the U.S. that you want to be judicious and precious with your use of those tax credits because the IRS gives you credits for money paid to the French tax authority. And without getting into the details, when you elect that foreign earned income exclusion, you may be losing some of those credits. So again, speak to your tax team to see whether, hey, I know I qualify for the foreign earned income exclusion, but is it right for me? Or is, is the smarter play here really to rely on my foreign tax credits? Let's, let's do that analysis. So, all right. Uh, Another another point to, to keep in mind would be, I know we get, because we do live streams for people who are French and US exposed. And, you know, sometimes we have like one over 100, nearly 200 people on those Zoom calls and they throw all these questions at us. One of the other popular questions we get asked is, hey, what if I set, set up an LLC in the US? And, and I, of course, I still have my U.S. bank account. I can open a U.S. bank account for that LLC. Can that help me legally avoid my French taxes? How does it work in cross-border issues with France and the U.S.? Uh, unfortunately, that's not exactly how it works, right? So just because the money is not received in France doesn't mean that it's not taxable by France. So, again, remember, France doesn't really have carve-outs in the way that the other Southern European countries have, like Italy, Spain, Portugal, or neighbors in Switzerland or UK, Ireland. So once you are involved in that economic activity within France, chances are even though the money is received by an LLC, a single member LLC or whatever outside, it's still taxable by France. And the, there are other complications that come with you controlling foreign entities and foreign bank accounts in terms of disclosure on the French side. So again, the, again, the takeaway there is, is, hey, you need to be conscious of both the French and the US consequences of your actions. So what may be tax optimization on one side may, be on, may not be on the other. So you need a team that has some sort of joined up thinking in, in getting that right. 
totalization agreement. So there's a totalization agreement between the US and most uh, Western European countries, including France, where you can, uh, under some circumstances, so we've had situations where people have, clients have come in or whatever. So they want to work remotely. They want to work remotely from France. You know, it's a beautiful place, wonderful place to be, but they want to maintain their employee-employee relationship with their U.S. employer. Now, I'm assuming that they're not too senior decision maker. They're not contract negotiators, that kind of stuff. Because if they are according, I think that's uh, section four. Five, I think of the US France tax treaty, it does create something called permanent establishment. So I'm not getting into that. I'm assuming that what you do does not trigger permanent establishment. Then there are opportunities using the totalization agreement. There's uh, an embassy government uh, entity in Strasbourg where you can register, work with your employer in the US and you can register as that company can register as a foreign employer in France and you can still work for, for that company. And when you do, you may be able to, because of this, you know, France social charges are, are pretty high compared to what you pay in the US, right? So, you know, assuming you're not going to be there for more than five years, there are planning opportunities. You can reduce the social charges. You can still pay social, you can continue to pay social security in the US and not pay in France, which is a huge tax saving, of course. So the, but you know, it, it takes some registration as you know, France is, France is pretty bureaucratic, right? And, and that's putting it lightly, but you know, there are, I mean, there are rules and you follow the rules and there are opportunities within those rules. So it's worth exploring, speaking to your tax team about that registration process and saving you money and, you know, potentially saving your employer some money as well in, in, in that journey. So, hey, heads up, things to think about as you engage with your preferred tax team. So I think we can come to the Q&A now. Oh yeah, lots of questions, right? So uh, again, the takeaway is one person does not know anything. If someone claims, if someone comes to you and say, hey, I know everything, I would turn in the opposite direction and run. I do not know everything, which is why I'm glad that I have a great team around me and we work together to, to solve client problems. So let's jump into questions. Now, the first question that I wanna answer was a question sent via Kathleen. So thanks for Kathleen for, for directing a question to us. So yeah, um, the question is quite controversial, right? It's about whether the US would ever move to a residency-based system of taxation, as opposed to the present citizenship-based taxation uh, structure that they have. And uh, you know, the popular comment on top of that is that there's only one other country in the world that taxes its citizens regardless of where they go, which is Eritrea, this tiny country in the Horn of Africa. So what's, what's up with the US? Now, I'm gonna tell you the truth as I see it, and I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, you probably won't like it, right? The answer is no way that is ever gonna happen, likely. So if what, you, what we do is, you know, it's of course, it's a, a political, uh, political question, but when you look at tax rules in the 20th century, uh, the U.S. has been a world leader. I mean, the U.S. is a world leader in many spheres of activity, but what many people don't realize is that the U.S. also leads the way when it comes to international tax. So rules are created and enacted in the United States. Other countries look and they follow suit. So, you know, we, we can start back in the 60s with transfer pricing, but the most recent example that I think is within everyone's memory is FATCA. So FATCA came out in like 2010, 2011, whatever. Uh, it was a rider to the uh, Hire Act, I think, hiring incentives to reduce unemployment, uh, to reduce unemployment and something like that under President Obama, right? So FATCA came in, lots of unintended consequences. FATCA is not a tax, as I mentioned earlier, it's a framework for information exchange. So the US signed bilateral agreements with countries across the world, including those that you'd never thought would sign like Russia and China. So basically everyone that's anyone of note in the world has signed except for uh, like your North Korea, your Cuba's, Iran, those kind of guys, right? But most of the countries that are note have signed. And under the FATCA, 
rules, these countries have agreed, including Switzerland, to basically put aside or set aside their local bank secrecy laws and mandate or require all their domestic financial institutions to go through their books and isolate and highlight anybody they suspect of being American, not even if they self-declare because uh, like I'm sure lots of you guys, just like me, we have more than one passport. So sometimes we go to a bank and we open a financial account with the other passport. But if that bank, and as part of its KYC, know your customer process, if they suspect you of being American or US exposed because of certain indices or certain indicators that they are required by law to look for, even if you deny it, they're required to report you to the US government. So that's how FATCA works. It's a framework for information exchange and you think, oh my God, what, what's that? But a few years later, we had something called CRS or the Common Reporting Standard or the Automatic Exchange of Information. So basically consider that FATCA on steroids. So every, all the rest of the world have been signing up on, on that. So, so, so here's the point. The rest of the world follows American examples. So when it comes to citizenship-based taxation, we're seeing, a creep, we're seeing increasing examples, especially in Europe, but also in other countries, Mexico and, and whatever. But especially in Europe, there's situations where even though you leave that European country, you are still subject to those taxes for at least a number of years afterwards, or even indefinitely. Key example would be Italy. We have uh, Italian-American clients, right? So if you leave, if you resided in Italy for a while, you're Italian, passport, citizen, whatever, and you move to somewhere that has zero tax, think of Dubai, or if you move to Malaysia and you have MM2H, so zero tax and whatever, Italy is still going to tax you. You have the fallback rules that Italy is going to tax you. If you leave Spain and you go to a so-called tax haven, again, Dubai, because Dubai is super popular right now, right? So you move to Dubai. For, up, for five or six years after you leave Spain, you're going to have to pay taxes in Spain. So a lot of European countries have these fallback rules, which means that they are following the example of, of, of the US. So again, at a high level, that, that it's unlikely that is going to change because we see other countries following that example. And remember when I spoke about international tax earlier, I said it's counterintuitive because when you're in the U.S., you're accustomed to thinking about the IRS, oh, they just want my money, they just want my money. But when it comes to international taxes and when you talk about infrastructure and deals like FATCA, people have made the argument that it's more expensive for the Treasury Department to administer FATCA and that information exchange situation than revenue that they collect from the seven or eight million US citizens that live outside of the US, right? It's more expensive to make. So it's not about the money, it's about information. And of course we know what's going on with social media companies, et cetera, right now. Information is gold. What the, what the US government wants is your information. And that's why those reports that you do, the FBARs, the 5471s for your foreign companies, your 8621s for your pension funds and your, and your other investment structures, your 8938s, your 8865s for your partnerships, it's more an information disclosure than it is revenue collection. And the US government is not going to give up the opportunity to collect more data. So unfortunately, people, I've, I know there are lots of lawsuits. I know there are uh, advocates outside of the U.S. who are on a campaign, but keeping that bigger picture as to what's going on and the trends that we're seeing worldwide, no. So I'm going to scroll back up to the top. And so the child tax credit for Americans residing abroad. So... Mm, my understanding of that, I'm not too clued up on that situation because my understanding is that mainly applies to those who reside in the U.S. When you reside outside of the U.S., I, the, the new child tax credits, I do not think that that applies. In addition to which, uh, for many of our clients, and, and this goes on the back of questions around the stimulus payments as well, many of our clients earn above the threshold, so they they phase out of the stimulus 
payments as well. So, but with the child tax credits, I believe it's not applicable to those who are residing outside the US, like most of our clients and us, that we all are. Please specify what exchange rate to use for FBARs, 8938s, and other forms that require us to convert amounts to USD average or year end. So with 8938 and FBARs, we tend to use the treasury rates. And I think when you read the instructions, they, there's a bias. They prefer that you use the treasury rates. If you want to use one of the other exchange rates that you can easily uh, choose online, there's space for disclosure of that, especially on the 8938. You can say, if you didn't use treasury, what rate did you use? You can disclose. But we use treasury for FBARs and 8938s. And we use for the other information, like your income and stuff, Again, there's no rules about what you should use, but we tend to use the IRS exchange rates, which are available freely at irs.gov, just to make it easier and consistent. So, and you know, few questions. Next question for FBAR with a joint shared bank account and with non-US person NRA, how does one declare the amount in that shared account full or half? Great question. So we declare everything in the account. Because remember, this is ordinarily, normally, there's no tax, right? This is just, hey, Uncle Sam wants to know what you're doing. And bear in mind, under FATCA, chances are the bank is reporting you as well. So, and we help some financial institutions do the reports. So we work on both sides. We work with clients like yourselves, and we work with financial institutions who need to report to the bank. So we have a team that does the FATCA submissions. So we know how it works because we do it, right? So it's an XML report that's done automatically. So my point is this. If you send your report on your uh, FBAR, your 8938, and it says you have $50 in it, and then the bank tells the, the, the federal government that you have $100 in it, it creates a delta. It creates uh, a mismatch. And it creates, I mean, whether they would ask, uh, whether they, you know, Treasury or the IRS would ask a question on that really depends on who you are and how big and, you know, which agent is looking at it or whatever, but they can ask. It's best if you just report everything that's in the account. Again, there are typically no tax implications to that, to so just report everything. So that what the bank tells the government is the same story that you've told the government. Nothing to see here, move on pick on somebody else, right? Uh, next question. Does New York State require former residents now residing abroad to file a tax, a state tax return? It depends, right? So we've had situations where, uh, so like, for example, I had an apartment in, in Queens, in, in New York. So if there's certain rules, like, for example, if you, if you have property in New York, and it's available, it's not being rented out, there's, there's no Airbnb, there's no tenant in it, then you can still be deemed by the state of New York to be tax resident in New York, even though you haven't been to New York for years, right? So the answer to answer your question, yes, under some circumstances, you can be deemed to be tax resident in New York, even though you no longer reside there. So again, speak to your tax team, about and and you can get a chance to get into the details of your unique situation to see whether you do trigger tax resident in new york or whatever state that you may have some connection to next question your recommendation on a book on u.s income tax or u.s expats <laughs> well uh i mean you know i I'm, of course i'm going to be biased I published three books. So the, the first book, which is on tax for international uh, entrepreneurs and expats, uh, it's available on Amazon. If you, depending on what uh, subscription you have with Amazon, it may actually be available for free. So it's available as an ebook, as an audio book or physical hard copy as well. Uh, other than that, on our website, hg.tax, I have over 2,000 articles in international tax, as well as over 1,000 videos on international tax Q&A. So there's a lot of free information out there, and there's a lot of information you can purchase. But because the U.S. code in particular is so nuanced, I mean, federal tax code, that's like over 8 million words. And then you have state issues, and then you living somewhere else. So that's another few million words in France or Portugal or wherever it is you are. So that's tens of millions of words. So 
my advice is good books. Yeah, all good, but get a good advisory team. That's, that's even, you know, probably a smart idea, right? Next question. Same question as Thomas for Illinois. Does Illinois ask for state taxes for expenses? So again, same answer. You'd need to really sit with your preferred uh, tax advisors and go through the rules around domicile in Illinois, California, you know, whatever state you're, unless you're in one of those eight states like you know, Wyoming or Nevada, you know, where, or Alaska, where there is no state income tax and you have nothing to worry about. If you are resident in any, or you have ties to any other state, have a conversation with your advisory team to really test whether you have filing obligations and deal with them. And more importantly, read domicile to a state without those. So you just don't need to worry about it, especially like you have states like California that were signaling that they were thinking about a wealth tax. And that wealth tax could be retroactive, even if you've left California within, you know. So speak to a tax team about whether you have any existing obligations and how and if it's in your best interest to read domicile to one of those states without an income tax. Next question from Vanessa. Are this tax penalties if we decide to transfer thousands from an overseas savings account into a U.S. savings account all at once, concerned about the state of the euro in the event of the escalating tensions in Europe and actions that we can take to minimize financial impact? So once that money has been taxed, uh, last year we helped a client move about 20 million euro from an account in a European country that I won't mention back to an account in the US. So the, all the bank wants to see is that you file taxes, that this is clean money, right? So this money has been taxed somewhere. So show me the tax return for wherever it's come from and show me your tax return as uh, the American bringing it back into the US. And of course, there are lots of other forms that are triggered by you know like the whole FinCEN stuff there's, so there's a lot of banking forms that they need to fill out but it's just bureaucracy it's just paperwork the most important thing is that money is clean it's been taxed and you can prove that it's been taxed uh wherever you've had it and that you are fully tax compliant and yeah you're right there's there, it should not be taxable on repatriation once it's already been taxed there should be no extra taxes to pay so hope that helps on the U.S. side of course on the European side, assuming that you're in Europe, there may be, you know, because if you have it in a tax deferred account, for example, some sort of assurance fee uh, or some sort of pension or insurance structure, there may be taxes due upon breaking it. So I'm talking about the US side. Okay, hope that helps. Moving down. Most of us are already in our abroad countries. Most of us are immigrants, long-term if not permanent residents abroad. So pre-immigration planning is out of the question. Okay, thanks, Helen. Next thing, Nina. If I inherited in the US, what is the best way to bring the money to France for a dual national? So, yeah. So in terms of inheritance and gifts, that is a specialized, uh, a specialized space. And so... I would recommend that you speak with uh, a French uh, tax attorney or a tax accountant on that. If, if you want, you can reach out to me. I'll introduce you to Hervé, who is based in Paris, or you can speak to your own preferred advisor on that. So it is, it is very, very nuanced, kind of like in the U.S. If we just look at it on the U.S. side, uh, of all the, I mean, tax is like a whole body of practice, right? So some people specialize in certain state tax issues. Some people specialize in uh, taxes for funds or partnerships or s corps or whatever. The area of U.S. tax with the most lawsuits, the most litigation is estate and gift taxes. More people get sued in that space than any others. So it is it's very, very nuanced. And I the same applies in, in Europe as well when it comes to the state and gift taxes. So I would recommend that you you speak to I'm, I'm assuming that on the US side you have proper advice. So I'd pro, I think you need to sit down and get, and talk over the details with your preferred tax advisory team in France. 
Okay. Same question as Nina. Same question as Nina. Kathleen, good point, Ellen, about long-term residence abroad. Yes, already. Some here more than 30 years. And then Ellen comes back. And of course, our kids born here, never lived in the U.S., never Im immigrated, not going back, but stuck with U.S. tax filings, no U.S. taxable income, not inclined to spend money. <laughs> okay, right. Uh, thank you so much. Do you have any any info for Monaco residents? I actually was in Monaco for the week last week. Obviously, so in terms of Monaco, <laughs> you're, you're sitting pretty, right? Because there is no personal tax in, in Monaco. So your situation will be akin to someone like in Dubai or any one of the tax havens. You don't need to worry about the domestic side, in your case, Monaco. It will just be purely US tax planning. So in terms of specific information, it depends on your situation. Reach out to your preferred tax team. You can reach out to us and we can talk you through that. Next question, Kareem. I have an LLC in the US, which in turn pays me in Spain where I'm legally resident and I pay Spanish taxes and that money earned and I take a foreign and income exclusion. Is there any reason to foresee that I cannot do the same in France when we move in a couple of months? uh no once you're declaring oh france france is is easy to the extent that uh there's a limit on what you can do right so in in spain or in portugal or ireland or in, you know in the uk we roll up our sleeves and we as tax advisors we get all excited because there are huge planning opportunities in those jurisdictions in france nah, there's nothing to do because there's just so little in terms of tax planning you can do. So you move to, to France. I mean, definitely speak to an advisory team about, because I don't know your unique situation. I just, I just know that you have an LLC, but of course life is more complicated than that. So I'd recommend that you do have a, a pre-immigration tax consult with someone who's qualified and ready to do so. But generally speaking, there's not much in terms of tax planning you can do when moving moving in, into France. Just be prepared to pay taxes and everything, pretty much. Next question. Uh, Tracy says that she sent an email about capital gains in the US and taxes in France. Sorry, Tracy, up to two hours before this, uh, we didn't receive any email, sorry about that. Next question. Treasury rate, okay, right, so somebody's responding to treasury rate, yep. Okay, that's fine, next question. Hi, Barbara's asking, if I have inherited part of a family home, but do not reside in, in that state, and she gives a state, would I be considered a resident of that state? Mm, depends on, it's so, normally there's a lot of indisher, so it's not just one thing, but, it could be a series of other facts and circumstances. So to answer your question, potentially, yes, because I don't know whether you're registered to vote. I don't know whether you still have an active driver's license. I, you know, I, you know, so potentially, yes. But like for the questions earlier on Illinois and New York, you probably want to sit with an advisor and go through your situation in detail to see whether that state may still have any claims on you. And regardless of that, it's still great tax planning to seek to actively and proactively re-domicile to one of those eight states without an income tax. So hope that helps. All right. There's a bunch of us from the AARO living in Germany. Can you say anything about taxes for your citizens? Dual, so dual US German citizens living in Germany. Uh, not at this point, if there's something you know, specific, but in terms of general, generally Germany is kind of like France in that there's not that many carve outs. So Germany and Scandinavia and France, not that much. Whereas in the lowlands, so like Belgium, Holland, because you know, Holland has its offshore thing going on as well. UK and its dependencies, uh, Southern Europe, Switzerland coming back on the other side, 
great planning opportunities advisors like us we get excited there's, there's stuff there's stuff to do but if you're in germany and france and scandinavia typically there's not much that can be done but again it's still worth having a conversation with a qualified and experienced tax professional to take a deeper dive into your situation to see what's possible moving down move to france recently what a reputable advisory team not even sure where to look uh, you can Google, lots of po stuff pops up. Otherwise, you can reach out to us, hgj.tax, and I can introduce you to Arave, and we can work together to see what, what, you know, how we can help you out. So you can reach out to us. So, so John is saying, me too. I would like the team to be reasonably priced. Well, you know, going to be 100% honest. We're not cheap. We're not the cheapest. But, you know, we believe that you get what you pay for. So there are guys that would do it for a certain price. And sometimes, not always, I'm you know, not casting aspersions on anybody. Sometimes it may not be the level of experience and, and uh, professionalism that you're looking for, given your circumstances. But if your situation is super simple, you don't earn much and you have a single source, then that's fine. You know, the guys, uh, you know, Google, uh, Google is your friend. Just have a look. The guys that do it for hundred dollars or two hundred dollars, and and maybe that's the right fit for you. But we're not the most expensive. We're somewhere in between. So moving down, so LNC. Okay, uh, sure, LNC USC. Sorry, your name is abbreviated. Uh, you just reach out to us at hj.tax. Happy to discuss. William Ulrich and your French rep is your French. So William is asking, is your French colleague conversant with US tax position can on French marital regimes? So it's it's a team, so not a one person show. So the guy in Paris isn't sitting in Paris by himself, nobody to talk to. You know, there are 10 other people in the office. So if you if you reach out to, to us, HG we we'll put you in touch and we can deal with both. The, the French and the, the US side. If it's something that's very, very nuanced and it's beyond our capacity, we'll raise our hands and say, hey, this is not for us. And we can recommend a, a French lawyer that can help if it's something that's too niche. So, yeah, moving down. So Michael Jackson, thank you, Michael. Uh, Kathleen, based on what Ellen indicated for kids born outside of the U.S., but still being a U.S. person, never having resided and lived in a state in the U.S., question, if the children vote in, in the U.S. based on my last state residence, Minnesota, would they, in fact, consider transferring to one of those eight states that have no taxes? Yeah, so, I mean... The same privilege that's available to you, uh, you kids should, well, first of all, yeah, so you, you kids, assuming that you are deemed to have been domiciled in the U.S., so you've lived in the U.S. for more, so it's not everyone that's American can pass citizenship onto their kids, right, so that, that's, that's worth uh, acknowledging, but for those that did have ties to the U.S. for the requisite number of years, and at least one parent was American, then yes, your kids can become accidental Americans. But they can renounce at 18. They can give it up when they'd like. And we have an article on our website that does talk to that. And I've also done these live streams with U.S. immigration attorneys as well. And, we, and we've spoken to those issues. So it's not that the kids can't give it up. Whenever they're ready and legally able to, they can give it up. And they, uh, they can avail themselves of the same tax planning opportunities that you do, you know, as you, should they decide to keep it. So they can select it you know if the, if it is that somehow maybe they went to college because that happens right they stay outside and then they go to the u.s for college and then they leave so maybe they're tied to the state uh, where they attended university they can switch state domicile just like you can so uh again with having a talk with a qualified professional to make sure that your kids are making the right steps and there's nothing that would bother them later on and Joe is asking, what about residency-based taxation? Joe, we mentioned, we, we spoke about that. That was the first question we answered. I, I don't know if you just joined us, Joe, but uh, on this recording, which Kathleen can make available, 
uh, we that was the first question we asked the question as to whether do you think whether my just my very humble opinion that the US government will ever contemplate switching from citizenship based to residence based taxation. So I kind of spelled out some of the uh, trends within U, uh, US politics and the wider macro geopolitical situation right now and the importance of data. So just to cut to the chase, the bottom line is, I don't think it's ever gonna happen. Uh, uh, just a few more, there's a lot, okay? So sorry to those on the other platforms that I can't get, but sorry. Uh, but I'll just deal with this last few and then we'll call it a day. So if I sell a home in the US, a non primary residence, can you tell me how the capital gains works in France from an income tax or social charges perspective? Thank you. Well, the, you know, in France, you're going to be taxing your worldwide income. Uh, if it's not, if you've not lived in it, so it's not a residence, so I guess it's an investment property, uh, it'll be taxable in France as well. So as to what the rates would be and stuff like that, I, I can't tell you that offhand. Uh, you, I need to introduce you to Hervé, who can give you the deep, deeper dive into the nuances of that situation. So just, just let us know. Uh, res, okay. What is, so, so question from Joe, Joe, I see a question on, uh, on politics. I'm apolitical. I, we don't take a position. We're just, you know, we're just a business, right? Just about serving our clients, regardless of their political shade or orientation. So we're apolitical. Marlene is asking for ballpark real figure for what you charge. So uh, uh, in terms of indicative fees, if it's a simple federal return, it's $600. If it's simple state, $300, simple FBOS, $300. Uh, if you have a foreign company, a, a simple 5471 is $1,500. Uh, simple 1120 is 1500 or 2000. So it, it really depends. Corrine, thanks for sharing. I admit being skeptical about these types of presentations <laughs> tends to be salesy. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot, Corrine. Uh, Kathleen, okay, thank you. And I see other questions, but uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your, your time. Thank you, Kathleen and the team at AARO for, for making this happen. Uh, Christine, I see she's just turn her camera back on. Thank you, Christine, as well. Thanks to all you guys. Again, if you want a copy of this to, to look over or to just share with your, your colleagues, please just reach out to Kathleen directly. Otherwise, we actually do our task. We do these live streams every week. I think in a couple hours, I'm going to do another one on offshore structures in the BVI, British Virgin Islands. So for those who want to get a little bit more sophisticated. But hope to see you next time. Good luck. Have a great day, night, morning, wherever you may be. Bye-bye. Here are four ways we can help you. Number one, sign up for free webinars on U.S. Expat Taxes and International Entrepreneur Taxes at www.htj.tax. Number two, stream premium educational videos at www.htj.tax. Number three, contact us for tax optimization consult over Zoom. Number four, high net worth. We can quote for doing your U.S. international taxes returns. Our books and upcoming events are available at htj.tax. Please subscribe, like, share, and comment below. Email us at help at htj.tax to engage us to advise on international tax or business matters.